So we are in John chapter 14 today, and we're looking at the subject of heaven. Uh, A few years ago, uh, we went through a series on heaven. Remember that? For those of you who are here, that was three years ago we did that that series. And it's been a while since we've been to heaven. And it'd be a a really good idea to go there now uh, because of this. We're in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6 today, and this just happens to take us with the words of Jesus to heaven. Now let me ask you this before we go further. How many of you would like to go to heaven? That's, that's a good sign. So we're in the right place. Uh, so we're going to go there right now, uh, see what the Bible has to say for us. Uh, but remember where we've been also. Uh, in John chapter 13, it was the Last Supper. Uh, it was the uh, Passover meal that Jesus was celebrating with his disciples. It was there at the Last Supper in the upper room where Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, and then Jesus identified Judas as being the one who was going to betray him. Remember that? And then uh, last Sunday we saw in John chapter 13, after Judas had left uh, the the upper room to go out and uh, make a deal to betray Jesus, uh, Jesus talked to the disciples about loving one another, and it was also there where Peter says uh, that... uh, I will never deny you. And Jesus said, oh, you're going to, you will deny me. Before the rooster crows three times, Peter, you will deny me. Uh, It's at this point, at the end of chapter 13, and before chapter 14 begins, or as chapter 14 begins, it's believed, most scholars believe that Jesus and the remaining 11 disciples, they got up from this Last Supper, the Passover meal. By the way, that's what we're going to be celebrating when we do our Seder here on a Good Friday in the evening, doing the Passover, the Seder, a whole lot of fun, get to see what Jesus and the disciples did. Uh, but they got it from the, uh, the Seder or the, the Passover meal, and the upper room where they were having the Last Supper is believed by many scholars to be over in this area, the old city of Jerusalem in the Jewish quarter. If you go to Jerusalem with us on one of our Israel trips, that's one of the places that you visit. But Jesus and the disciples would have then uh, left the upper room, walked out this way, and come across here. This is the Kidron Valley as they made their way up to the, uh, up to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus would be betrayed. Now this right here, uh, the picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. So you're looking across the Kidron Valley. So the Mount of Olives is up here. The Kidron Valley goes down and then it comes up. And this is a hill that is going up. Here's the road. Here's the Temple Mount at the time of Jesus. Uh, the temple would have been here. You can see it over on this one too. So they're making their, their walk here. And as they are walking, Jesus is talking to them. He's giving them some, here's some basic final things that you need to know. And we're going to see it in just a few minutes. He begins by talking to them about heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. He's going to tell them that because uh, he's letting them know, I'm going to be gone. It's just a matter of minutes, a matter of a few hours before I am going to be betrayed and put upon a cross. So he's going to let them know, don't let your heart be troubled. Then he begins to talk to them about heaven. And then after that, as they are walking, he talks to them about prayer. How many of you would like to have your prayers answered? Amen. How many of you like to know how to have your prayers answered? Jesus gives that instruction as we continue through John from this point. And he also tells us about the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does, what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. And we also learn about the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I know some things. I want to know about heaven. I want to know where I'm going. I want to know how to pray so that God hears my prayers and my prayers are effective because I need that. And I also want to know this. I want to know how to have the power of the Holy Spirit in my life because for some strange reason, it seems like the longer I am in this life, the more difficult certain things have become spiritually. There's more pressures. There's more this. There's more that. I don't know why that is, but it seems to be that way. I've been a pastor for, for about 25 years total now. And I look at my life and I think, man, I need the Holy Spirit's power more now than I ever have before. And as I look at this and where we are going, starting today with, with heaven, and then going to the place of heaven, our prayers answered, and the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us in that victory, I think, man, praise God we are going to this place in the Gospel of John. But the disciples and Jesus, they make their way on this trek and they're walking over to this place that the Bible calls the Garden of Gethsemane. It's at this place where Jesus was betrayed. The Garden of Gethsemane is on the Mount of Olives. 
And uh, so they're making their way there. Judas is going to betray Jesus with a kiss in that garden. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, I encourage you to do it. That garden is also one of the places that you uh, visit while you go to Israel and see where Jesus was betrayed. But with that, uh, we're going to go to heaven right now. And we're going to find out for most people, most Christians even, heaven is not necessarily what uh, we think. Um, I, I want you to think of this too. When you travel somewhere, whether it be in the United States or maybe just in the state of California or out of the country, uh, typically what you will do is you'll want to know about the roads. You're going to want to know about the place you're going. You're going to want to know what the weather's like, right? You're going to, uh, what kind of clothes should I wear? Uh, do you need reservations? Um, are there any stops along the way? Who can I see? What are the must-see places that I'm going uh, to go to? Uh, so you, you check those things out, and you do a thorough exam. And you get a tour guide if you can. But when it comes to heaven, most Christians are like, eh, I'll see when I get there. Why is that? Why the Christians should be most excited but go, man, I want to know this place I am going to. When I was going to Italy, I wanted to find out two things. How good is the food going to be? And I, it was really good. And, and, and I wanted to see the Colosseum, and I wanted to see other things. And, and uh, you, you plan things out. Who am I going to meet? You know, the, the great places. Why would we not do that when it comes to the subject of heaven? So the Lord Jesus Christ is our tour guide, and the Bible gives us some hints. Unfortunately, today, it's, uh, we're not going to get an extensive lesson on it. We're not going into a whole series on, Revel on, on uh, heaven like we did a few years back. Uh, maybe in the future, because after going through this twice this morning already, I, I feel like I need more heaven. And man, this world can be a little discouraging at, at times, can't it? So in uh, John chapter 1, just verses 1 through 6, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In other words... Again, Jesus is letting them know, I'm going to be betrayed, right? And you guys are going to be devastated. You and I go through this world, and sometimes we have things that trouble us. The word to the apostles is saying to us, let not your heart be troubled. Listen, it's going to be all right. In my Father's house, verse 2, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said in verse 6, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. That's as far as we're reading today. But let's start to figure out how uh, this works out in our life. Because I believe it's going to be very encouraging. First off, uh, let me get this out of the way. It's uh, heaven what it is not. Heaven is not boring. Um, the devil wants us to believe that heaven is boring. To me, listen, all right, I understand some of you might play the harp and you think that sounds awesome. I'm going to sit on a cloud playing a harp forever and ever and ever. Um, that, that's not what the Bible teaches. Just so you know, I, that, to me that sounds boring. It might just be because I, I'm not a musician. I have no music skills whatsoever. Uh, but to play forever and ever and ever just a harp sitting on a cloud by yourself does not sound exciting to me at all. Uh, if you are a harp player and you want me to come visit you on your cloud, if that's you, I will come visit. But I'm not going to stay that long because I think there's a lot more going on in heaven than sitting on a cloud uh, uh, doing that. But the enemy wants us to think, uh, that. The enemy wants us to think that, uh, that we're going to get wings when we die. Listen, that's not in the Bible. Did you know that? There's movies that teach uh, when, when, a, when a Christian dies, they get angel wings. Hence, you get pictures like that. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, but we will be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, but uh, but it, 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 it certainly is not boring. Uh, another thing with heaven is uh, we'll never have to go to the doctor. We'll never have to go to any type of clinic for whatever reason. And it's, it's going to be an awesome place. When I think of heaven, um, for me, because I've studied the subject a lot, uh, I want to encourage you. It's going to be great. And what I'm going to say are not things that I've made up. However, we're going to see what the Bible says. 
and I will throw some things into your imagination to think about. And you can argue with me about them if you can prove me wrong. Is that a deal? Okay, so heaven, uh, what it is. Well, let's find out what heaven is. Uh, we, we read here, or, or in, in verses 1 through 3, Jesus says again, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Don't be discouraged. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So let me do this with some questions and answers. Sound fair? Okay, I'll, I'll ask some questions, and then I'll give some answers. That way, we can get through this and see what the Bible actually has to say. First question is this, is heaven a real physical place? I'll say yes it is, and then we'll see why we can know that. But Jesus says here in verse 2, in my Father's house are many mansions. So what is that about? Well, let's go back in our minds some 2,000 years uh, into Jewish culture. Uh, when a man and a woman are going to get married, they've decided to get married, they enter into what's called the betrothal. Think of our engagement, except the betrothal is much more binding. To get out of a betrothal, you actually have to file for divorce. So once the deal is done, you are betrothed to one another, you will get married to one another. All right? And this is how it worked. Once the couple is betrothed to one another, the groom-to-be, he goes back to his father's house. And what he does, he begins to add on to his father's house a place for him to live with his bride-to-be. In fact, when you go over to the Mideast today, especially in the Palestinian sections, you will see houses that are massive, that live by the, the people live by this concept. They add on to the house of their dad or their grandfather, and they have these huge, huge houses over there. So the groom-to-be, he's adding on to his father's house a place for his bride to live. When, tell me this doesn't sound like Jesus coming for us, when his father says, okay, the place is ready, the groom goes to get his bride, goes to her village, and all this music is playing when the groom arrives. Doo, 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 there's all the fanfare and everything. The bride-to-be is waiting at her house. She is waiting in anticipation. She does not know the day or the hour that the groom is going to come for her. But when she hears the music play, man, she comes out the door, and there she is, and the groom takes his bride to his father's house, to that place where the room is added on. It is that concept that Jesus is talking about here. Man, the day is coming. You are going to hear the trumpet blast. And I'm going to say, come on up here. And you are going to come up here to this place that Jesus has been uh, working on for some 2,000 years. And I'm thinking it's going to be a pretty spectacular place. So is heaven a real physical place? He says this. Think too. He also said this in verse 3. I am going to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So what is there? It's this place. It's not a non-place. Jesus says it's a place. He doesn't say, I'm going to prepare a non-place for you. And where I am in this non-place, I'll come and get you. I'm preparing a place. And where I am, there you may be. And something else I want to say here too. You might be thinking, I, you know what, this just doesn't make any sense to me. This place that Jesus is building, I always believed I was going to live on a cloud playing a harp, you know. that. Uh, what do you mean? Listen, Jesus is not up in heaven. Looking down on earth. And he, didn't, he doesn't promise us I'm going to build a place for you. I, I, there's, listen, I'm going to add on to my father's house. It's going to be an incredible thing that you're going to see. And he's not up in heaven looking down on earth and, and looking into Beverly Hills and saying, wow, those Kardashians have an awesome mansion. I didn't think of that. I hired the wrong architect. Oh, Eve, he's not doing that. Jesus has been working on this place for some two thousand years have you thought of that if this is the creator of the universe and i think man it is going to be an awesome 
place. As Randy Alcorn says, we do not long for a non-body or a non-location with a non-culture suspended in emptiness. We desire a new body and we are promised one, a new body designed for our new location and even a place that will have culture. I, I like that. I need a new body. Anybody else need a new body? How many of you want a new body? Amen. I asked, I'm not kidding, I asked first service, how many of you need a new body? It's like nobody raised their hand. I was like, seriously? I mean, you should have seen the people I was looking at first service. You're much better looking than they are. Don't repeat that. I could get in a lot of trouble. Let's think of what the Bible has to say about heaven, right? Uh, Heaven is in Hebrews chapter 11, is described as a city. So what do cities have? Cities have uh, people, music, buildings, activities, gatherings, art, cafes, uh, culture, um, athletics. Will there be athletics in heaven? Okay, here we go. Some of you might be thinking, well, of course not. That's so ridiculous, Pastor Tom. You're going to hear a lot more ridiculous in a minute if that's what you think. Why would there not be athletics in heaven? Whoa, it doesn't make sense. Well, does the cloud make sense to you? Right? I mean, let's think through this. The problem we have in our mind, we think that everything of this world, everything of this earth, for example, is sinful. Is athletics sinful? You might be thinking, well, other things in cities. What do you you mean cities? There's going to be music in heaven. Ah, Listen, there's going to be music in heaven. And that music is going to be out of this world. We are limited on this planet. We are confined because of the curse of sin. our, Our brains are limited. Our imaginations are limited. The animal kingdom is limited. All of creation suffers under the curse because of the curse of sin. Uh, so you start thinking of, okay, music, art, uh, I, I think art is going to be out of this world too, just, well, literally, but it's going to be off the charts. And you start thinking, is, is art sinful? Well, some art can be, but art in and of itself is not. Men have made things problematic. Men have made things sinful. You want to know what else I think is going to be in heaven? Cafes. I think, that I, I, seriously, I think you start thinking heaven described as a city in the New Jerusalem, cafes in heaven. You might be thinking, yeah, but coffee is sinful. Is it really sinful? But, well, maybe not. Well, then why would there not be great coffee in heaven? God made coffee here. Right? You start looking and you're going, wait a minute, Pastor Tom, you are kind of nuts, but all right, that's, that's... I imagine going into a heavenly cafe. I like cool, hip cafes and going into a heavenly cafe and thinking, man, this planet never had nothing like that. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's going to be pretty outrageous. And as far as the athletics go, this is what's going to happen in heaven. I'm going to be able to play a good game of golf. I'm convinced <laughs> miracles can happen even in heaven. Uh, the Bible also describes heaven as a country in Hebrews chapter 11. When we look at the mountains and the sea and the lakes and, and valleys and we think, wow, that is awe-inspiring. But that creation that we see is also suffering because of the curse of sin. We look at creation like this and think, man, that is so beautiful, and it is. And like this, just think, this is suffering under the curse, right? And you see something like this. Uh, sunrise or sunsets, I think in this valley we have some of the most beautiful sunrises in the world as the sun comes up over the Mount San Jacinto. And, and, and it's so cool. You look right now and you, you have green everywhere we are looking. I was driving down Gilman Springs and I have never seen so much green out here before and it is just looking so beautiful. But all of this is suffering because of the curse of sin. Uh, We have rivers and beaches and oceans and lakes and trees and flowers and on and on and on. But the heavenly country, uh, I can only begin to imagine what it's going to be like. Uh, So much so that the Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, when he was caught up into paradise, a.k.a. the third heaven, God had to humble him with a thorn in the flesh because of the things that he saw of heaven and the things that he heard they were way too marvelous and god said i gotta humble you paul this is going to be a huge huge problem so with that number one first question is heaven a real place yes uh number two where's the exact location of heaven i'm going to make this simple it's up 
Real genius, huh? Well, let's see what the Bible says about this. How do we know it's up? Well, the Bible describes different types of heavens. Um, in Genesis chapter 6, we have the first heaven, which is our immediate atmosphere where the birds and the trees are. That's the first heaven. And then there's the second heaven. Uh, that is outer space. That's the cosmos, the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies, the uh, things you look at in the night sky with a telescope. And then there's the third heaven. That's the place where God currently dwells. And, and that's the place that, um, that Paul also said, I was caught up to paradise, the third heaven. I was caught up there. Uh, the third heaven is also the place when a believer currently dies. Their soul goes into the presence of the Lord. Did you know that? They're waiting for that new body. Woohoo, we get that new body. But their soul is in the presence of the Lord. And they, friend, your friend, your loved one that died, they are seeing the things that the Apostle Paul saw in the third heaven. And they're up there going, man, I can't wait to have my new body. Man, this is going to be so awesome up here. Can't wait to see you guys up there. And we are going to be reunited with them, all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, in that place known as the third heaven. At the same time, for me, that is very encouraging. Because I, it seems like every single day now, I get news of someone that has lost a loved one. Uh, whether it be somebody from this church who knew the Lord, or somebody who didn't know the Lord. And uh, there's a lot of heartache, for obvious reasons. Uh, the other night, it was Thursday evening, I had dinner with some friends of mine that I very rarely see. Uh, we were friends some 35 years ago. Uh, none of us were saved. Uh, the two gentlemen I had dinner with the other night, we were all roommates at one time. They do not know the Lord yet, um, but for uh, over 30 years I've been praying for them. And uh, we met, we only meet, we've only met a few times over the years, and one of them was talking about uh, one of our mutual friends that died uh, this past year. In fact, I uh, did the memorial service for him. His name was Mark, and my friend Mike said to me, it just doesn't make any sense. He's looking, and he goes, he's just dead. He's gone. It's hard for me to believe he's not around. Um, here's the thing with you and I. Uh, with my friend Mike, I'm praying for him, uh, that he gets saved. I'm convinced his friend Mark that passed away was saved uh, from lots of different reasons that he had the Lord. But when somebody passes away in First Thessalonians chapter 4, we are told that we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, even things we're looking at today. Those who don't have the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ, when a loved one passes away, man, it's devastating. Like my friend Mike, lost. Um, but when you know the Lord, it still hurts, but there's still hope because I'm going to see him again. I think of someone who's lost a, a mom or a dad or a child or a brother or a sister or a grandparent or a grandchild. Folks, it hurts. It hurts. But praise God, we get to talk about heaven because we know we're going to be reunited with them in that place. Let me share this with you. Uh, I think it was C.J. Mahaney who, who wrote this. He writes, perhaps you've come to this place where life has challenged you. You have trials and tribulations that have burdened, discouraged, depressed, or even traumatized. Perhaps your dreams, your marriage, career, or ambitions have crumbled. Perhaps you've become cynical or have lost hope. A biblical understanding of the truth of heaven can change all that. In 1952, young Florence Chadwick stepped into the waters of the Pacific Ocean of Catalina and determined to swim to the shore of mainland California. She'd already been the first woman to swim the English Channel both ways. The weather was foggy and chilly. She could hardly see the boats accompanying her. Still, she swam for 15 hours. It's a lot of swimming. When she begged to be taken out of the water along the way, her mother, in a boat alongside, told her she was close and that she could make it. Finally, physically and emotionally exhausted, she stopped swimming and was pulled out. It wasn't until she was on the boat that she discovered the shore was less than half a mile away. At a news conference the next day, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. He writes, consider her words. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. 
For believers, that sure is Jesus and being with Him in the place that He promised to prepare for us where we will live with Him forever. If we can see through the fog and picture our eternal home in our mind's eye, it comforts, it energizes. If you're weary and don't know how you can keep going, if you've lost vision and hope, no matter how tough life gets, if you can see the shore and draw your strength from Jesus, you know you're going to make it. This is what a right understanding of heaven is. It helps us to see where we're going and go, wow, it's not a non-place. It is a real place that Jesus has prepared for all those who love him, and we are going to be reunited with our loved ones. In this place, the Bible describes as the third heaven. Uh, Jesus, Ephesians chapter 4, tells Christ ascended far above all the heavens, the first heaven, the second heaven. He ascended above them. It's up. And in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, as the disciples watched, Jesus was taken up. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Heaven is up. I believe it's likely a different dimension from what we currently experience. Also, from what the Bible teaches, there are, uh, there are good angels and bad angels. The bad angels are known as demons, and they're, they're, they're here. They're on this planet. And, um, but God doesn't allow us to see those things. We're limited in our dimensions, but there's a whole spiritual world, and the Lord is going to take us up to that place where we'll be reunited with our loved ones. Uh, So we have the first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven. The Bible also describes a couple of other heavens or types of heaven. One of them is the millennial kingdom, and the other one is the new heaven and the new earth. So I just want to deal with these last two things before we wrap it up, all right? So with the millennial kingdom, what is the millennial kingdom? Uh, That's a good question, number three. Uh, The term millennia comes from two Latin words meaning 1,000. The understanding of a future millennial 1,000 year rule with the Lord Jesus Christ comes from the book of Revelation, which says this in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 that we shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. This is great. So, this is what the Bible teaches is coming. There's a seven-year tribulation period. There's a rapture, a seven-year tribulation period. At the end of the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus is coming back. And all those who are in Christ are coming back with Him. And He is going to rule and reign for a thousand years over this millennial kingdom. And the millennial kingdom is going to be glorious. Uh, Let me give you a little bit of a comparison. In this world now... Currently, there's violence and riots and civil unrest and murders and racial tension and traitors and liars and deceivers. There's wars and earthquakes and pestilence and fires and tornadoes and hurricanes and on down the list. But in the millennial kingdom, no mas. What do we have? Peace on earth, prosperity, justice for all, safe communities, ethical integrity, no wars, famines, riots, etc., 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 Some people believe that the entire planet will be like the Garden of Eden. I don't know if the whole planet will be. I know Israel will be. But when I think of the topographical changes that are going to come to this planet, oh man, it gives us it gives us great hope for Hemet. You hear, you've heard, you've seen the bumper sticker that says Hemet is heaven. Maybe some of you have that sticker. Don't throw it away. It could become a collector's item in the millennial kingdom. You don't know. Or you might have a coffee mug that says, Hammond is heaven. Do not lose it. It could become priceless during that time. You think I'm crazy? What does the Bible have to say? In the millennial kingdom, there will be changes to the planet. And they're big changes. Isaiah teaches... The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. You you think of all the rain we've had and the blossoms are happening now here, and the millennial kingdom, it's going to be way off the charts. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. God's creation with joy? God's creation singing? 
No way, Pastor Tom. Well, you argue with God then. I'm just telling you what His Word says. And they shall see the glory of the Lord. We shall see the glory of the Lord. The excellency of our God. Wow. We think of this place currently being cursed. The millennial kingdom, which I don't think is too far in the distant future. And I think, man, it is going to be totally awesome. But let's think how we got here, right? Go back in the book of Genesis to the time of Adam and Eve. And what happens? Satan tempts Eve and says, Hey, Eve, you're not supposed to eat of that fruit that's in the midst of the garden, of that tree. Oh, that's not true. God doesn't want you to eat of that fruit, Eve, because he knows once you eat of it, you will be like God, and he doesn't want you to be like him. Eve, it, give it a whirl. So she took the fruit, and she ate it. And then she said to her hubby, Hubby Poo, taste some of this fruit. It's delicious. Have some. So Adam took the fruit, and he ate it, and hence sin entered the world, and all of creation suffers under the curse, and Adam and Eve were removed from the Garden of Eden. I read about this, uh, uh, what took place there, and um, one day Cain and Abel, uh, their kids, one day Cain and Abel found a wall, and they climbed it, and they looked over. They went back to Adam, and they said, Daddy, you will never believe what we saw. They then described the luxurious foliage, the fruit and the flowers. And they said, Daddy, do you think we could ever live in a place like that? Adam said, we did once. That was before your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> so, glad you got it. So good. I didn't, I didn't want to have to explain it. It would have been awkward explaining that one. In Isaiah 51, of this millennial kingdom, the Bible says, For the Lord will make Zion's wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Wow! Man. Final question. Number four. So we have, uh, is heaven a real place? I uh, can't remember what the second question was. Oh, we're not at the final question yet. Dummy me. So in the millennial kingdom, changes to the planet... And there will also be changes to the animal kingdom in the millennial kingdom. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 tells us, The wolf also will lie down with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. Um, I like this. Changes to the planet, changes to the animal kingdom. Animals are going to get along. Uh, you live in this valley, you know that there's a lot of coyotes out here, aren't there? It's like you drive to Walmart, you drive to Stater Brothers, you drive to Sprouts. It's like everywhere you go, the chances of you seeing a coyote are pretty good. So where we live, um, I don't know about you, I don't like rats. I've never met anybody that actually says, I love rats. Uh, well, wait, I take that back. I, I remember, uh, wait, there are people who love rats. Pet rats in cages. But I don't know anybody who likes wild rats running around their house and carrying diseases and, and, and things. And uh, so I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like mice running around my house either. And, and uh, they, they're, they're bad news. Um, so I don't like rat traps either. And, and so I have cats. Cats are really good against rats if you've got a good cat. And, and I've had several. The problem is, there's coyotes. And coyotes get my cats, and I'm not too happy about that. I look and go, man, when we have this new kingdom that's coming, the rats will be pleasant. The mice will be pleasant. The coyotes will not eat my cats. And the entire animal kingdom is going to be changed. It's going to be a cool place. That's just the millennial kingdom. So we have, uh, number one, is heaven a real place? Number two, uh, where is heaven? Uh, number three, what is the millennial kingdom? Uh, number four, uh, this is the last question, is uh, will the coming new earth, because there's a new heaven and a new earth coming, uh, when, uh, will the coming new earth have seasons and weather? I think so, and I'll show you why. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, speaks of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. and says, in the middle of its street, that is the street that's paved with gold, 
Gold that's so pure you can see through it. It's transparent like glass. That, God uses gold for asphalt up in heaven. Right? So I have this ring, this wedding ring. Um, I got it years ago. And uh, it's, you know, I could afford it at the time. I think I got it for $22 from I don't know what store it was. You know, I don't know, Kmart or wherever it was I got it from. Um, but that's what I could afford at the time. I know some of you guys are like that. You got what you could when you could, especially when you're young. Um, but we, we get gold here and we make jewelry out of it. And it becomes very meaningful to us. God says, let me give you a comparison. In heaven, I got gold that's way better than what you got. You can see through it. It's like asphalt up here. God wants us to have that understanding of the differences. In the middle of a street, the street that's paved with gold, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding fruit every month. Okay. I like fruit trees. I plant fruit trees. I enjoy fruit trees. I have a lot of different types of fruit trees. Something I know about fruit trees, they bear fruit in their season. This says 12 different fruits every month. Does this mean that there are 12 different seasons? I don't know. This is what we know. We are limited. We have winter, spring, summer, and fall. We know that because God created winter, spring, summer, and fall. We can't imagine a fifth season or a sixth season, let alone 12 seasons. But I find it quite fascinating, the things that God has for us. Uh, the Bible also tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I have not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Let me tell you something else, all right? I have several friends that are vegetarians. I don't understand that. I tried. I've, I've explained that to you before, right? I've tried. Um, you know, it's supposed to be healthier and all. But many of my friends tell me that you're not going to eat meat in heaven because uh, you're not going to be killing animals. So I look at the Bible. I say, well, that makes no sense to me. God gave us meat. And let me tell you, ribeye is delicious. Anybody agree with me on that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Could you imagine in heaven? Listen, is this out of the question? That there will not be a ribeye tree. You go, no animal sacrifice. This tree with a ribeye, oh, it's got the perfect marbling on it. It tastes better than any. Could you imagine an In-N-Out burger tree? There, why not? I mean, I just, you know, maybe sometimes I get a little bit extreme. I don't, I don't know. Why not? We think of God's creation. I has not seen nor has entered into the heart, nor we heard has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Um, we think of this God's creation. Who would have thought of an animal like that, right? You look at these things. Aren't those cute? Look at that. That is so adorable. Um, how about this one? Can you say Pepe Le Pew? It, they might be, you never know, it could smell like perfume. Heavenly aroma. We don't know. Right? You know, this is just crazy. God's creation is, is just wild. Who would think of a fish like that? <laughs> or a fish like that? You, you, start, you start thinking of these different things of God's creation and uh, so we have animals here, and for some reason we stop, uh, and we forget animals here are suffering because of the curse of sin, and that they, why would there not be off-the-charts animals in heaven too? Um, then just, this is the Grand Canyon, cursed. Uh, just the, the beauty of God's creation, just absolutely uh, beautiful. Um, Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. But, he said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Uh, listen, when we get to heaven, we're going to see all these outrageous things, I'm convinced, that are just incredible. So incredible that the Apostle Paul, God had to humble him. You're not allowed to tell anybody about what you saw. Um, but most of all, we're going to see one another. We're going to be reunited with our loved ones in Christ and we're going to see the Lord Jesus face to face. With that, I, I know this will take me a few minutes over, but I'd like to close with this story. Would you, would you put up with that from me? 
It really helps to put everything together in the words of Jesus. Uh, Ruth Anna Metzger was a professional singer. Uh, her story uh, illustrates the importance of having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, knowing that Jesus, you're saved by Jesus. Several years ago, she was asked to sing at the wedding of a wealthy man. According to the invitation, the reception would be held on the top two floors of Seattle's Columbia Tower, the Northwest's tallest skyscraper. She and her husband, Roy, were excited about attending this event. At the reception, waiters in tuxedos offered uh, luscious hors d'oeuvres and exotic beverages. The bride and groom approached a beautiful glass and brass staircase that led to the top floor. Someone ceremoniously cut a satin ribbon uh, draped across the bottom of the stairs. They announced a wedding feast was about to begin. Bride and groom ascended the stairs, followed by their guests. At the top of the stairs, a maitre d' with a bound book greeted the guests outside the doors. May I have your name, please? I'm Ruth Anna Metzger, and this is my husband, Roy. He searched the M's. He said, I'm not finding it. Would you spell your name? Ruth Anna spelled her name slowly, and after searching the book, the maitre d' looked up and said, I'm sorry, but your name is not in the book. There must be some mistake, she said. I was the singer at the wedding. The gentleman answered, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you did. Without your name in the book, you can't attend the banquet. He motioned to a waiter and said, show these people to the service elevator. The meskers followed the waiter past beautifully decorated tables laden with shrimp, whole smoked salmon, and magnificent carved ice sculptures. Adjacent to the banquet area, an orchestra was preparing to perform. The musicians all dressed in dazzling white tuxedos. The, the waiter uh, led Ruth Anna and Roy to the service elevator, ushered them in, and pushed G for the parking garage. After locating their car and driving several miles in silence, Roy reached over his hand uh, and put it on Ruth Anna's arm and said, Sweetheart, what happened? When the invitation arrived, she said, I was too busy. I never bothered to RSVP. Besides, I was the singer. Surely I could go to the reception without RSVP. She started to weep, not only because she missed the most lavish banquet she'd ever been invited to, but also because she suddenly had a small taste of what it will be like someday for people as they stand before Christ and find that their names are not written in the book. Throughout the ages, countless people have been too busy to respond to Christ's invitation. Many assume that uh, the good they've done, perhaps attending church, being baptized, singing in the choir, or helping in a soup kitchen will be enough to get them into heaven. But people who do not respond to Christ's invitation to forgive them of their spins, sins, their, their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. For them, their default destination is not heaven, but it's hell judged for our sins. In that day, no explanation will excuse or will count. All that will matter is whether our names are been written in the book. Have you said yes to Christ? These are glorious promises of heaven. But you must say yes to Christ. Jesus himself said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But, no one comes to the Father except through me. Those aren't religious words. Those are the words of Jesus. Singing in the worship team, serving in a church doesn't get you into heaven. Uh, serving in a soup kitchen doesn't get you into heaven. Being a pastor doesn't get you into heaven. Only being forgiven in Christ Jesus. I want to ask you this. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're forgiven? Because according to Jesus, there's no other way to enter heaven. None. We will be judged. Your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you want to know that when you die, you're going to heaven? Do you want to know your sins are forgiven? Do you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that heaven is yours? Listen, Jesus loves you.